Good evening and welcome to the first of our Foundation Year Program Conversations for 2021. I should actually say welcome back, but I'm conscious that we have a number of new people with us tonight, people who presumably heard about all the good things we discussed in our first term and decided that they didn't want to miss out on such stimulating material. In any case, regardless of your reasons for joining us, I can say that you are in for something very good indeed. Tonight, we are being led by Professor John Milbank through a consideration of the ideas of Duns Scotus and William of Ockham, both 13th century philosophers who represent a turning point as we move from the Middle Ages to early modernity. As for Professor Milbank, he is now Professor Emeritus at the University of Nottingham, but prior to his time at Nottingham, he taught at the University of Virginia, the University of Cambridge, and the University of Lancaster. He is the founder of the Radical Orthodoxy Movement in Christian Theology, a critical philosophical response to modernity, which has gathered or garnered adherents across the Christian traditions. So it is our privilege to have him with us now. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Father David Harris to ask Professor Milbank our first question. Uh, Professor, just to echo Father James, uh, so grateful that you're here with us. Uh, no, no, it's absolutely delightful. Well, probably nobody on, on the planet that I'd rather hear about Occam and, and SCOTUS and the moment that they represent. Um, the audience, ha at least half the audience who've been with us the first term are, are still intoxicated by uh, the vision that kind of emerged out of antiquity and climaxed with Dante. And we build this particular talk as the big turn. Uh, why, and when, when I mention this to, to, uh, to people, they say, you know, we've heard of Aquinas, we've heard of uh, Luther and Calvin, uh, we've never heard of this Occam and Scotus. How, how can this be such a significant turn in the world of philosophy and theology? What, what is this big turn that we're talking about? Well, yes, that, 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 that's a very good, good question. And I think that um, in most people's mind, the, there's some kind of big gulf between the Middle Ages and then the Renaissance and then the, the early modern period. Uh, and um, it's really only since the work of um, a Catholic philosopher, Etienne Jusson, that people started to realize um, just how much of um, even a, 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 a particularly early modern 17th century thought was, was still rooted in the, the medieval legacy. And so I think that since Gilson's time, people have come more and more to realize that uh, talk about the Middle Ages is in many ways quite arbitrary. And it could be that the really um, decisive shift or one of the decisive shifts, you know, I'm wary of talking about the decisive shift, but a decisive shift happened um, within the Middle Ages um, itself. Now, um, what was the nature of that shift? Um, I think to put it, you know, you've mentioned Dante and, and I think that's really good. You, you could say that up to 1300 or so, um, people were still on the whole in the space of, you know, the patristic synthesis um, and that the church fathers had combined um, the vision coming from the Bible um, with, uh, in many ways, a largely platonic legacy um, and and uh, uh, th this had produced um, a sense of reality that you could describe as something like symbolic realism, you know, that the, the whole world is a book charged with, with, with symbols, with significance, that's speaking uh, to us in some way of, of God. Uh, and that, that there are two books, the book of the Bible, and the book of the world, and they, they somehow resonate with each other. Um, and we could talk about this worldview as analogical and as participatory. Maybe a, a good way of looking at it would be to say that it was in a certain sense enchanted. And I suppose the simplest way of talking about this big break 
is that um, somehow people became um, wary of aspects of um, the pagan legacy, um, um, it, wary in a way of this great synthesis. Um, but that was partly in reaction to a shift that had already taken place, and that was the greater discovery of Aristotle, particularly Aristotle's metaphysics, largely by way of, of, of the Arabs. And um, it, it, in some ways, the, the Aristotelian perspective um, suggested a rather deterministic kind of view of the world, or, or a sense that a lot of the world could be explained in naturalistic um, terms. Now, uh, the, so the, the reaction against Aristotle, uh, involving particularly a sense that this somehow impugns the divine freedom. So increasingly you get the sense that um, the world could have been different, you know. So instead of this sense that the world is a kind of emanation from God, it's inherently participating in God, people start to say, well, the world just is the way God has set it up, but it could have been different, and it doesn't necessarily disclose to us anything of God. So you get this greater sense of, of, of a divine um, distance. Um, people are worried that somehow if you have this sense focus on the natural uh, and the determined, that there won't be any need for God any longer, or that we will revert to some sort of pagan Aristotelian God. And a lot of the people in the arts faculties were developing uh, the kind of philosophical theology that could have pointed in that direction. Now, so the big question would be, okay, they're worried about Aristotle in particular. Um, but why then didn't they just sort of re-insist on this patristic vision? Um, and ever since Peter Lombard, they tried to do, put together all the different things that the fathers had said. Why didn't they just go back to that? Well, the answer is that, you know, some currents did try to go back to that, that especially um, in the German Dominican tradition, you get um, a new insistence on Christian Neoplatonism, if you like. So the most famous representative of that is, is, is Meister Eckhart. But on the whole, um, in the wake of this suspicion of Aristotle, people started to become more suspicious even of this platonic element in the Christian legacy um, and worried again that this somehow subjects God too much to um, necessity. So the, 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 the big shift um, we're talking about um, is to do with an emphasis on the absolute power of God, the idea that um, God could have done things differently, um, he has a sort of absolute power in reserve to um, revise things um, if, if he wants to do that. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it gets much more complicated than that, but that's probably the biggest aspect of the shift. So th this isn't just a matter of something that's happening in universities. In 1270 and 1277, from the Archbishops of Canterbury, Paris, and then from the, uh, um, backed up by the Pope himself, you're getting a series of condem condemned propositions. So that, you know, the papacy then is like now, Catholic theologians then have to work within um, a different space. And uh, some of these propositions seem to condemn things even in the thought of Thomas Aquinas himself. So um, this is one reason, it's an official uh, political thing that you, you now have to do things differently. Um, I'd like to come to the next question. Uh, so how do, um, so we've had the context, going into specifically into um, 
Occam's razor and his uh, nominalism. Uh, how do they sit with the broader philosophical inquiry that you've outlined, uh, and in particular the scholastic tradition, which was um, predominant at the time? Um, yes. Well, I mean, the the the, the debate about the universals um, is is not. Um, by no means completely new. The debate about the u universals has been going on ever since Carolingian times and particularly um, since the 12th century. So this is um, a, a debate broadly speaking um, about um, whether universals are real or not or they're simply something more like mental conventions. Um, so, you know, if I talk about um, uh, uh, humanity, or if I talk about um, treeness or plantness or flowerness, it, it is, is that a real thing? Is, is there a, a kind of real abstract essence of treeness? Or is that just a very kind of thin, um, generalization, or is it even um, just a mental fiction, just a, a form of words that, that we're generalizing? It doesn't correspond to, to, to anything real. Um, but, uh, and, and uh, it, it's very important to say that um, these debates were always from the outset very much linked to Christian doctrine, because um, the doctrine of the Trinity talks about three persons in one essence, um, the Christological doctrine talks about one person in two natures, so immediately the question is what is this essence, what is this, this nature, how, how are we to think about that? Um, and um, the, the, the most common Christian approach is to suggest a kind of double realism so that individuals are real and, and universal essences are real. So the persons of the Trinity are real, but the essence of God is also real. Um, and uh, the, the person of Christ is real, but the, the, it, he also embodies in himself the whole of human nature and the whole of divine nature. So the, the whole, if we're talking about this patristic synthesis that I've already referred to, and the kind of the main lines of scholastic tradition built upon that, then they, their most natural sympathy is with realism, and partly because of these theological doctrinal reasons. But there were always dissidents from Rosselin through to the famous name of Peter Abelard, you know, who was a, a, a kind of badly behaved adolescent from Brittany um, right from the outset. And he already adopted a nominalist position. Um, but during the course of the 13th century, on the whole, um, realism won out. Um, and uh, so Bonaventure was a realist, Aquinas was a realist, Scotus was a realist, even though um, in other ways, as we'll come to see, Scotus represents a break. And that, of course, raises the issue of whether um, the question of universals was the most important and decisive issue. I would argue it probably wasn't. But nonetheless, um, the, the idea that there are sort of real shared essences goes along with this, what I'm talking about as this enchanted view of reality. So the idea that universals only arise when we're generalizing about reality gives a more disenchanted view of reality because it suggests maybe that there are just individuals that happen to be the way they are because God has so determined that. Um, so, you know, trees just happen to re resemble each other um, because God has made some things that, that, that look like each other more than other things. But this doesn't necessarily mean there's some kind of essence of treeness um, to which they all have to conform. So 
that the the shift towards insisting that the god's power is absolute and the world might be other than it is constituted at the moment um goes along with this drift towards what you can call a, a kind of atomism um and, and a getting rid of the idea that the there are the, the there are these sort of inherent structures of the world that represent order so when it comes to Occam we find that um he has a nominalist view of universals um to begin with he seems to say they're just fictions later he seems to say they're they're more like very very thin generalizations that have some sort of ground in in reality um so he he, he does shift his position but um, he, he's for the same kind of reason he's very suspicious of the reality of relation so um you, you've got a similar argument about relation if you're related to something um is that relation somehow in you you know is my being a son somehow in me or is it essentially external um to me do do relations enter into the very nature of the things that are related um so once again the the nominalists tend to be suspicious of the idea of the reality of relations and perhaps the most extraordinary thing is that it then becomes quite difficult for them to to think about um christian doctrines of, of the trinity and the incarnation and and they have to find ingenious ways around that and in some ways they tend to water down the, those doctrines um, and, and I think one consequence of that is that the content of those doctrines become just kind of arbitrary revealed propositions. And uh, this goes along then also with something Jean-Luc Marion has been talking about recently, this sort of shift in the sense of what revelation means, that it um, starts to be something more like sort of extrinsic information hand, handed down from above rather than something um you can only know for a certain attitude of mind through 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 an attitude um of of, of faith so i mean part of the what happens after scotus and then with nominalism it is a greater separation between um reason and and revelation that once upon a time they were both contained in a sort of carapace of degrees of intensity of participation in god now they're tending to get rather separated and yet the irony is that revelation itself is determined in a rather rationalistic kind kind of way um these these are like sort of pieces of of, of of information um so um yeah that 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 that's <laughs> that's broadly my answer to to how the debate about universals fits into what what i've been saying that's wonderful i've actually got two questions so yeah. in in one so i think it probably would be helpful if i asked them one at a time to give us a chance to yes. explore the different areas a bit more fully so the first one is because we've got these two names here, which are Occam and Dun Scotus. And I wonder if perhaps you could talk a little bit, please, about where these two thinkers really differ. Are there any similarities? Oh, there are, there, there are both similarities and great differences. But, um, well, it's important to say they're both British, although Dun Scotus probably comes from just north of the border. And Ockham from Ockham, which is now somewhere in the London suburbs, uh, the Surrey suburbs. Um, but they're, they're both Franciscans and they're both very, very marked by the sensibility of Oxford. And um, uh, then as now, there's a kind of difference between sort of the typical Oxford mindset, if you like, and, and the typical Parisian mindsets um, with, with the Oxford mindset already uh, very prone to be obsessed with questions of logic, of, of language, of, of, of meaning and so on. 
even even if everybody at all important lands up in Paris in the end. So one um, shouldn't sort of exaggerate that division. But I think this this common Franciscan uh, and an Oxford background is very important. Um, the, the Franciscans tended to stress love and the will um, more more than the the intellect. Um, but again, perhaps ironically, um, their work is fantastically intellectual. So if, if you compare Scotus to Aquinas, Scotus is about 10 times more difficult to read. He, he's, he's much, much more difficult to follow that, 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 than Aquinas, who is in many ways uh, an almost misleadingly luminous um, kind of writer, whereas Scotus is full of very, very complicated um, technicalities. And, and, and that can seem almost like a contradiction. You know, these are Franciscans. They're supposed to be out. Francis didn't even think Franciscans should be teaching in, in universities. How's this happened, you know? Um, and why are they, it's these people who are doing this, this very, very technical stuff. And, but I think part of the answer to that is that somehow for them, the, the intellect, unlike for the more Dominican tradition, has stopped being something mystical in itself. So that all the, mystic, the mystical side of things, if you like, is more to do with love and the will. But when it comes to intellectual matters, this has become a very kind of tight, logical, technical um, mode of inquiry. So um, let, let, okay, Dud Scotus, let's just try to cut through a morass of incredibly complicated stuff and, and focus on three things. Um, most crucially of all, university of being. So Aquinas in this both Aristotelian and Neoplatonic tradition thinks that um, the whole of created reality is um, like God in some sense. It's unlike God and yet it's, it's like God. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's almost like a series of, of, of theophanic disclosures through, through which one ascends. Um, now, uh, so uh, uh, the structure of being, as people will late, later say, is analogical. So it's neither the case that um, um, everything is fundamentally the same or that everything is fundamentally different. The whole order of the world is, is a series of, if you like, family resemblances, um, rough family resemblances. So it's this that, that Duns Scotus questions. He says that on the contrary, being is not fundamentally analogical, it's univocal. In other words, everything exists in the same way. You know, that lamp uh, um, doesn't exist any more than the trees outside or that I exist. They either exist or they don't exist. They're either there or, or they're not there. And you could already see how this is a more sort of strictly logical way of thinking about things. So that Scotus is very worried that, it, 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 according to the law of non-contradiction, um, something is either the case or, or, or it's not the case. It can't be, be the case and not the case at the same time. So he is worried, interestingly, that somehow analogy violates um, the principle of non-contradiction, in at least taken in the way that um, perhaps um, Thomas Aquinas um, um, was talking about it. So he thinks that even when you talk about God and being, uh, God and creation, not being is said in the same sense. Now, this can sound as if he has no mystery about God. That, that's not true. That, that would be completely unfair because um, while Aquinas says that God is to be, he is being in itself, um, Scotus insists that the prime term to think about God for thinking about God is infinity, so that God is an infinity of being. So he's an infinity of just the same kind of being that we have, um, he, he, you exist or you don't, and he exists, but, but his in, in infinity of existence makes him very different. Um, 
uh, and, it, and in fact, really more unapproachable um, than it would, things would be, seem to be in terms of um, analogy. Now, he wants, Scotus wants to insist that um, God um, exists univocally in the same way that do, we do, because otherwise he thinks the proofs for God's existence won't work. So um, he, he argues that proof depends on university of meaning. If, 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 if the terms of a proof are inconsistent, then the proof just won't work. Um, so that, that's one primary. We've already mentioned uh, the principle of non-contradiction. Now we've got the proofs of God's existence. And then the third reason he believes in university is more theological. Aquinas had said that the first object of our intellect is um, material things that we sense. It's a, a very Aristotelian view. Duns Scotus um, worries that this only applies to our fallen reason. So that, that because before the fall, we had, we had a, a much more immediate access um, to God. Um, so he argues that the, the first object of, of our, our reason is in fact being in this univocal sense. So that before the fall, um, that took us immediately to God. Now it has to go through material things, but that's just contingent. It's not metaphysically fundamental. So that's the third and perhaps rather more difficult to get hold of reason why um, he's switching towards um, university uh, of being. Now, um, the, 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 the second thing that um, is crucial in, in the case of um, uh, Duns Scotus is the so-called formal distinction. So for, for Aquinas, there are, you can distinguish things intellectually that are really combined so that you can, um, you can uh, talk about a window in terms of the top of the window and the bottom of the window, but it's really all one thing. And then you can have real distinctions. Windows are not walls, glass is not, grass, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Don Scotus talks about a third kind of distinction that problematically hovers between the two. Um, in, in other words, um, the, the, it, it's something that is sort of imminently distinguishable. Um, it, that um, somehow if you chop off a finger from, from a hand, it, it remains a finger. For Aquinas, it would be much more the case that a finger is only a finger because it's part of a hand. For, for Scotus, um, it, 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 it can become something like a thing in itself. So that, that um, a formal distinction doesn't mean that things, aspects of a thing are totally separable, but they're not totally identical. It's not just our mental distinction. There's a distinction going on within the thing um, it, itself. And he would apply this even to God. So he would say, for example, that God's truth um, and God's justice and God's love are formally distinct from each other. Whereas Aquinas would say in God, they're not distinct at all. God is completely simple. Uh, and it's only from our point of view, they're distinct. Um, whereas Scotus seems to slightly modify um, this um, um, simplicity of God. Now, how, do, how does this doctrine, the formal distinction relate to the doctrine of university? Well, that, that's a difficult question. But roughly speaking, um, the, the formal distinction is related to the Arabic philosopher Avicenna's understanding um, of, of form. So that Avicenna thought that um, forms in God, the ideas of things in, in God, are pretty much the same uh, as I ideas, our ideas. So that they, you know, the the uh, the the idea of a leaf as it exists in a leaf is pretty much the same as the idea of a leaf uh, as it is a form in in the mind of God. So you can already see how this is pushing towards 
university. It also means it's kind of a doctrine, it's a sort of atomic doctrine, that Avicenna is thinking of all these forms as being like little atoms. So they're the same atomic gradients that you get in, in, our, in our reality. So there's a link between university uh, and this kind of atomic approach to platonic forms. For, for Aquinas and for his teacher Albert the Great and for the German Dominicans, um, it, it's a completely different matter. They much more think that all the forms are unified in God and then they emanate away from him and they become more diverse as they emanate away so that plurality is not there up there in God. There is no formal distinction. Plurality is, is the result of something like an emanation. And that fits with this whole analogical participatory way of thinking of, uh, of things. So it's as if Scotus' is, is outlook is linked to a different kind of platonic understanding of the forms. And this is one reason why it's very, very important to insist that Scotus is not a nominalist. Um, uh, on the contrary, um, he, uh, uh, like Aquinas, he thinks that um, our ideas of things uh, are, as universal are real, that universals are real in, in, in our mind, but he also has a doctrine of common natures, according to which even outside our minds, that the forms of things are, are real and distinct, even, even though they're thought of in this rather atomic Kind of, kind of way. Now, one of the reasons why more recently thinkers like Honefelder in Germany, Olivier Bonoir in France, tend to think that Scotus is the bigger break than nominalism, is that you can argue that nominalism is a kind of generalization of the doctrine of university to absolutely everything. So that university um, is saying that everything that exists exists in the, in the, in the same kind of way. Um, and then if you apply that sort of approach to, to thinking about, about universals, um, you land up saying, well, every particular tree is simply a tree in the same kind of way. That doesn't mean there is a universal form of, of, of a tree. It just means a tree is, the sa is being a tree in the same way that another tree is being a tree uh, and so on. So it, it, it's again this sort of almost kind of demythologizing ki kind of move that, that's going on. So, uh, and it does seem that, that, that Occam has a more extreme doctrine of university uh, than Don Scotus in, in other ways, um, where Scotus is, is sort of prepared to suggest that university only applies to, to being, to put it too crudely, um, whereas there are other kind of added bits of difference that aren't univocal, um, Occam tends to say that university applies to, to everything. Um, that, that there is only, uh, the world is only, if you like, a pattern of samenesses and, and, and differences. It's as simple as that. So very, very quickly, we've got university, the formal distinction, and then the, the third thing, and this is the thing perhaps Don Scotus is most famous for, is his doctrine of hyseity or thisness, um, made very, very famous by the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins in incredibly vivid poems. So he, he, he's said, this is to do with the doctrine of individuation. Um, that there is something unique that makes particular things um, what they are. Uh, so for, for Aquinas, uh, on this sort of analogical um, um, way, way of thinking of things, um, Aquinas thinks that um, everything is composed of essence and existence. In God, essence and existence are identical. In, in everything created, they are different. And insofar as an essence comes to exist, it's existence itself that individuates. So that in a way for him, 
individual although that happens through matter individuation is is something um directly united with the created act of god but if for scotus um you, you've got the sense that insofar as things exist they just exist in the same way then you much more have to explain why things are different and you have to do that in in a less um vertically relational kind of way because things just exist according to god's will they're not sort of emanating in a disclosive way from god so he he seems to have to add this very ineffable principle of of, of individuation it's 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 a complete mystery there's some quality of pure thisness that makes a thing um what it is and it's it's perhaps sort of arguable to you know possible to say that it it wouldn't be true that aquinas doesn't have a strong sense of individuality that might be too romantic a way of looking at all this it's just that he has a different metaphysical account um of of the way in which um that 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 comes about um so it it's I guess it's for those three reasons mainly that you can see Dun Scotus as really the biggest revolutionary. And, and there are other things as well, but increasingly scholars have traced his influence through to Descartes and even through to, to Kant, you know, and have argued that there are many ways in which Kant is still operating within a kind of Scotist. Um, conceptual space and of course from the point of view of theologians this raises the quite exciting question of well is modernity really committed to a certain kind of medieval theology you know and and can one call that into question i think in particular it it, it brings to the forefront the idea that actually some of the key modern thinkers never really engaged with the authentic thought of Aquinas, you know, much less um, earlier figures like Boethius and Augustine of the Greek fathers and so on. Okay, so I have a follow on, if I could please, about this idea of hysteity. Um, so the reading I've done would suggest that this is, and please do correct me if I'm wrong because I'm trying to understand it, um, as I'm sure a lot of other people are as well. Um, that it's not something, um, it's not qualitative, so it's not related to the qualities of a individual substance. Is it therefore, because it seems like it's, it's something that's quite intangible, quite slippery, quite difficult to pin down, if we are yeah. contemplating a particular individual substance, for example, a table, is the hesaity something we are able to actually nail down and articulate in any no, way? No, because, because it's a quality um that 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 inheres in in this table this uh you know that it's what it's to do with individuation because remember that um in a way occam doesn't need this because he's anomalist so scotus is not anomalous so he's got he's explaining how um a universal essence gets individuated and he's um he's denying that this derives um um from matter he de uh, which is a, a usual traditional aristotelian explanation on the contrary he's saying it's some I ineffable quality I mean, and this is why hopkins is so able to turn it into poetry so you know he'll have this sense that this this particular secret hidden dell exerts an extraordinary spell that he can't quite put into words um, um but 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 can only sort of celebrate in in poetic song oh i like that i like the idea that you can you can't you can't lay a hold of it but you can um as you as you say celebrate it so thank you for claiming yes. that yes it's really helpful mm -hmm. I'm going to hand over to Father James now. Yeah, thank you, Lucy, um, for some excellent questions, and to Daniel and David. Um, Professor Milbank, I think what I'm going to do is, in fact, because uh, I, I had thought of a question, but you've indeed covered everything uh, beautifully, I'm going to throw it open to the floor now, 
and uh, see if there are ideas that are emerging from, from the uh, people attending. I see that uh, Ruben has a question, so I'll just ask him to unmute himself, please. And Ruben, once you've done that, if you could uh, step forward and pose your question. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think you, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, I can. Thanks, Ruben. Yeah. Um, I think you touched on this, this briefly in terms of uh, SCOTUS having a less strict idea about exactly what um, uni university means, but, but they're, they're not being a treeness doesn't mean that there isn't a humanness. Um, so, so what do the nominalists have to say about, about the idea that, that uh, the existence of, of some universals doesn't mean that everything that seems to us to have a category corresponding to a universal actually does have a universal. So, so you know, why is it that, that to, to Occam, say, you couldn't have a humanness and, and not also have a treeness? Well, you can't have either for Ockham in a certain sense, because he's a, he's a consistent anti-realist. I mean, as I tried to indicate, the, the question is, does he think that universals are complete um, fictions? Um, and uh, th there is some evidence that, to begin with, he thinks they're complete fictions, you know, flattus voces, in other words, empty wind, they're windy phrases, they're, they're useful, they're instrumentally useful for us in, in, in talking about the world, but they don't correspond to, to anything in the world. Um, I think in his mature thought, um, it, it, it's more that he's saying a generalization is in some sense true of reality, but there is, there is no universal empty of, of it, uh, its instantiation of things, even though in, in some sense a generalization is objectively true. It's, it's not just our convenient way of, of looking at things. There, there really is something shared in common between people, trees, flowers, stones, trains, buses, etc. Um, and um, but but all but all the same, it it it, it it's it, it's very weak, um, and and individuals are now the primary reality. Whereas you know, for an older outlook, um, universals are the pri pri the prior rea reality. You know, there is there is some kind of essence of humanity, and um, that explains how there are individual human beings. They're individuations of that. Um, universal essence um and, and and that's an outlook that he's he's getting rid of um and uh it, it, you can see how this is part of a you know very considerable um intellectual shift you know that the the whole hellenic outlook saw um tended to explain things in terms of form and ideal form, that even though Aristotle's position was different from Plato in that he thought you only get forms in things, nonetheless, he thought that form is, is, is something real apart from its individual in, instantiations. It's, it, it, it's part of the order of, of, of reality. It's, it's showing that reality is informed by a logos. But now you've got this suggestion that somehow this isn't in keeping um, with a more biblically derived picture of God. And so a lot of this feeds into the background of the Reformation. So it's almost like sort of two very rival visions um, of what the biblical vision actually implies. I mean, we haven't talked so far much about the question of voluntarism, and um, that's a little more complicated than people sometimes think. I, I don't think that with either Scotus or Occam, it's the case, it's the case that they think of God as simply having a tyrannical will or that his will determines reason so that he could, you know, he could decide that two plus two equals five. It's not quite like that. It, it, in the case of Scotus, it's, it's, it's much more the case that he's somehow separating reason from will more than Aquinas did. So it's, it's as if 
um, reason is no longer very teleological. It's not, it's separated from will. You know, even in the case of the mind of God, there are all these rational possibilities. And then his will simply picks out some rational possibilities from other, possi uh, from other ones. In the case of, of Occam, um, it, 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 in a curious kind of way, Occam is much nearer to also having a doctrine of the simplicity of God, um, like Aquinas does, because he doesn't have a formal distinction any longer. Um, and, and so it's not quite true that Occam is saying God is a great big will. It, it's more that he insists that in God, will and intellect are, uh, are identical, but it's completely ineffable. So that we don't have any really clues, we don't really have any insights, whereas for, for Aquinas there's more of a ladder of ascent, you know, we, we can grow towards some kind of insight into the mind and will of God. It, that, that's not the case. So effectively it's as if God is arbitrary, even, even though um, it wouldn't quite be quite accurate to say the, that Ockham thinks of God as arbitrary. And he, he certainly thinks of him as love, but it, it, it's like a very obscure kind of love of a sort, indeed, a rather kind of fearsome headmaster, if you like. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, we'll move on now to a question that uh, Father Thomas Plant would like to put to you. So, Father Thomas, if I, you could unmute yourself. Hello, Professor Milbank. Good to see you. Uh, hi, we hi, we hi. often see each other on Twitter, of course. Yes, yeah, could, as one does. <laughs> indeed, good to see you again. Um, a, a question, uh, forgive me a, a, a preamble, I'll try not to emphasise the ramble too much. Um, we've, we've focused very much in the first year of the, or the first part of the course on um, on Plato and the Platonic influence on Christian theology. Yes. We, at Plato. we read Aristotle, uh, parts of Aristotle, um, yeah. looked at Neoplatonists and their influences on Christian theologians, yeah. different kinds of influence, uh, uh, emphases of Platonism, the, the yeah. Dionysian strands, the Augustinian and Boethius and so on. What we haven't really looked at so much, well, we haven't looked at it at all, is is how Aristotle re-entered the the the, the, blood, the intellectual bloodstream of the West um, in in the run up to Thomas Aquinas, as it were. So much of what had been lost to Latin Christendom. Yes. And, and my question is about the influence of Aristotle um, on uh, these these developments of um, uh, university of being and voluntarism in Scotus, and then on top of that, yes. Um, yes. voluntarism in in um, in, in uh, Ockham. To, to yeah. what extent is you know are the first two um, a development or an exaggeration of Aristotelian epistemology, <coughs> uh, and the latter a kind of um, Exaggerated response or repost to um, by, by uh, Aristotelian the latter, metaphysics. What, what did you mean, Thomas, by the latter? Sorry, I. Yeah, I, sure. I mean, is it is it better to say that you know? What did the latter refer to? Sorry. To voluntarism is voluntarism oh, a response to Aristotelian metaphysics in a kind of uh, avaristic mould, or uh, uh, you know, a, a fear of yeah. uh, determinism? But but then on the other hand, is you know a, a university of being and nominalism. Yeah. A response to, or, or in fact, an exaggeration of Aristotelian yes. epistemology. No, it's, a, it's it's an important question, I, and I think um, I would start by saying that you have to sort of rip up nearly all the kind of particularly Anglo-Saxon textbooks. Um, uh, 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 they're all misleading because there just didn't exist a pure Aristotelianism in the way we would now think of it. If, if you follow the more recent researches of people like Alain de Libra, especially in France, what, what they talked about uh, as the peripatetic was a weird mish, mishmash of everything. You know, these are people who thought for a long time that the Liber de Causis, which is clearly by Proclus, was by Aristotle. They said, if you could even think that's possible. Um, and the other um, extraordinarily interesting thing is that the Arabs had books of Aristotle we've now lost. In other words, they possessed some of the books where by all report Aristotle does sound more like Plato, you know, and, and more kind of somewhat Pythagorean and, and, and so on. So that, you know, we don't know what Aristotle thought, probably, 
not only you know you know we have these rough records of students taking notes you know what he really thought we don't know um he was probably of the school of, of plato and and you know we we have actually lost some books they possessed and certainly from our point of view what was coming from the arabs was a blend of aristotle with with um with plotinus or a blend of aristotle with proclus um, and sometimes a blend also with things from Hermes Trismegistus, who is thought of as also a peripatetist. I mean, it's, you, you, you know, once you've taken those things into account, you see, we're, we're not dealing with, it, it, it isn't in any convenient form for, say, a modern analytic philosopher of religion to handle. Um, and and if, if they try to, they're probably going to get it wrong. Uh, and ask the wrong sort of questions. Perhaps not just historically, but even in the end, I would I would suggest conceptually, um, because that that they're, they're, they're sort of inheriting a crudified, bastardized kind kind of tradition. So that I think the answer to your question is that what you get from Avicenna is, if you like, one kind of Platonic Aristotelian synthesis that I've already tried to describe in terms of this kind of atomism of, of, of forms um, with a strong, you know, even though Avicenna doesn't have a full-scale doctrine of creation and he's very sort of quasi-pagan, he nonetheless has this slightly kind of Islamic strong sense of the will of Allah, or of, the, of the will of God, of, of God's will as sort of picking out and 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 choosing um, from 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 certain things. Um, so so that I think um, you know that the university is is certainly coming from one sort of strand of Arab peripatetic philosophy but but whether we say this is aristotelian is is almost if meaningless i mean and on the other hand you know what we think of as analogy as you know i'm you will know of course is you know a combination of this Arist aristotelian doctrine of causality ad unum um with elements coming from from from, from proclus um um the, the 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 this more kind of platonic emanative view so it's you know it's very much in, in aquinas as a, a, you know a combination of of those elements you know that because in many ways you know aristotle's metaphysics leaves um certain questions open <laughs> so so that you know in the case of aquinas um his analogical view is is a different combination of Aristotle with Platonic elements. So, I, what I'm really getting at is that I don't think it's a case of sort of Aristotle versus Platonism. I think I think it's a whole lot more specific that, than that. I I, I would guess. Um, and uh, trying to remember the other part of what you were asking, but um, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, okay. One can say that the, these these Avicennian currents. So that in many ways, Gilson already said that Augustine was increasingly read through Avicenna, especially by the Franciscans. And I think, to some extent, this distorts to this very day what we think Augustine um, is is actually saying. Because you know, I'm one of those people who thinks that Aquinas is more authentically Augustinian even than Bonaventure, and, and that Bonaventure is actually distorting Augustine through um, this uh, very sort of avaric sorry, Avicennian perspective. But, you know, Avicenna was often used against um, more Averroistic influences, because Averroes represents um, despite even in his case some neoplatonic elements he's you know he's less neoplatonic it's more like um the kind of aristotle we would we would think of and and therefore it, it, it's sort of worrying really related to doctrines of the eternity of the world um and, and of the physical resurrection 
yeah so that so that you can see how the avicennian perspective can sort of mutate to something more like a stress on the will of god whereas the avaristic one is is the really worrying one that this you know this seems to involve divine necessity and so on but but of course what's interesting um, is the way Dominicans like Albert and Aquinas do use more of Averroes than than the uh, um, than the Franciscans dare to do. But again, I think that you have to think of this in a very synthetic way. That it's it's precisely because their mode of Neoplatonism is more Proclean, and that that Proclus has a higher view of matter, and and Proclus insists that God. It, you know the, the the one or God is is always more active than the, the 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 lower causes that you can sort of blend that more positive sort of Proclean view of the presence of the divine even at the lowest end with this more Aristotelian element. So again, none of this looks like the textbooks. It, you, you know, the, it, it doesn't mean that because Aquinas uses more avarice, he's he's dumping the Neoplatonism. It's it's the, the, the you know the more recent scholarship just doesn't allow you to think in those kind of ways. And I think it's actually much more helpful for theology if we if we um, if we do start to 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 take a, um, account of that. But I think. Um, I think in general that, um, yeah, that voluntarism is a reaction against this sort of sense that the world is, is a huge theophany, you know. Um, it's rejecting that as being somehow too sort of um, disturbingly um, quasi-pagan. But, but I think it's, it's a huge mistake and that you know, the, the irony is that in some ways, um, in the case of Scooters, by making that separation between reason and will, it, it, it's almost as if he think, he's thinking of rationalistic possibilities in a prosaic Leibnizian way, sort of too predetermined. So too much indeed like pagan fate, that, that you know, you're getting a kind of duality of fated reason and then kind of pure willing that becomes like our modern willing will choice. And so um, I, I agree also with people who say that somehow Franciscan thought is pro so liberal, that it's it's stopping, it's, it, it's ending a more teleological account of will and thinking of will more and more as kind of pure choice and, and, and so forth. And this fits with their, their, their political opinion, their positions, which is something we um, you know, really, really got into. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Father Lars, I'll ask you to uh, come forward. I see you've got a question. Uh, thank you, Professor Milbank. Something you said earlier um, really struck me and helped me in its simplicity. You said uh, something like, the world could have been different, thus we can't trust that the world can disclose anything about God sort of in, yes. about that yes. kind of not that yes. you're saying that but my i have a no, no. question following on from that um how would they understand then the world as being created good well i think it, it, it's a really good question and usually the simple ones are the, the big ones the, the best ones because they reveal things and i agree that uh, um it it starts to become problematic and you had more and more towards doctrines of a kind of good or or a kind of justice that we can't discern you know in the, in the later augustine there's the beginning of that particularly in relation to the question of predestination and so on but i think that gets intensified and it's a cliche but i think not completely untrue that the late middle ages were grim you know if we think the pandemic's bad they they had a black death wiping out you know over over 50 percent of the population and that they the tendency towards um a rather darker view i think was was, was quite strong um and uh um yeah i mean it, it, you you then you 
you tend towards an idea that somehow the will and the charity of God um, can't very easily be discerned. They, they stop having any space. I mean, maybe they're accessible to a particular kind of mystical experience, um, stressing, stressing um, turning the will towards, towards God. Um, but, but that can already start to take this rather um, quietest mode, this uh, uh, notes of indifference, self-obliteration, um, that, 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 that kind of thing. Um, but I, I, th I think that, that, that's right, that if, um, if you can't see sort of concrete things as, uh, you know, mediating the good in particular ways, it, 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 the sense of God, God's goodness can start to diminish in, in some way. And, and uh, you know, it, it becomes a question then whether, you know, the magisterial reformers, you know, are, are stressing divine love enough, you know, you, you know um, uh, faith in a, an inscrutable God seems to become more the norm. Good. I guess um, I don't see a current question coming in. I'll put one to you and, and just hope that it's uh, semi-coherent. That is just, uh, we've talked about, you know, universals and, and then um, how the discussion uh, comes to uh, focus more on particulars. And um, in terms of uh, Lars's uh, question right now, um, the, the potential um, for diminishing our ability to perceive God in in the particulars uh, because of the uh, turn away from the, the world's potential to communicate the good. Are we, if we carry all of this forward, are we running into uh, um, sort of a, a, a problem that leads to atheism or, you know, you know because of the, the materiality of the, of the, uh, of our focus, I mean, are we moving in the direction of, of sort of philosophical atheism? I think there's a real danger of that. I mean, I think if, if you lose the sense of the primacy of the actual that you get in Aquinas and the way the actual order of things discloses, that, then you, you drift towards the idea that potential is just as important as actuality. That, you know, things might have been otherwise and therefore, um, you know, things are pre predetermined by a sort of logical structure of possibility, or else they're just arbitrary, or the, they're a combination of both. And I think whether we're talking about a doctrine of the primacy of potentials, or we're talking about uh, the will as the arbitrary, that that can eventually drift towards towards atheism. That that you know, you you if if you lose this sense. Um, of a God in whom reason and will are united by by love, um, um, you 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 um, quickly you land up, well, you land up first of all with a kind of God who's unattractive, you know that that's a huge factor, that that people start to reject um, a God who is no longer very attractive, who 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 seems. Um, um, completely arbitrary, um, and of course, the more you, you, you know, the university, at least crudely understood, can drift into the idea that God is just a, a very big example of the kind of power that we have within the world. Um, and then, you know, so often you get on Twitter people saying, "I don't see how anybody intelligent can believe in any sort of." God, a God, how, or a sky fairy, etc. So that you lose the sense that uh, Christians and Muslims and Jews don't really believe in a God. They believe in God, who is big, who is the, the whole of reality, who's beyond these contrasts of individuals and universals. But, but the more and more God is a sort of rational idol, I suppose, 
he becomes unbelievable. He becomes intellectually unbelievable. He becomes unattractive. And yet at the same time, um, the ways in which we are now thinking of God as pure possibility or pure will or a mixture, they can easily be kind of naturalized, you, you, you know, whether by way of Spinoza or, 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 or something else less mystical. Um, uh, um, uh, you know, and uh, I think I think conversely that in many ways, um, you know, that our discovery that there are the sense that there are spontaneities in the world, but there are inexplicable vital forces that everything is not mechanically determined, um, has always sort of nurtured um, a kind of minority report, modern Christianity. Um, and I think another thing that's happening at the moment intellectually is that people are more and more coming to see that people thought of as too esoteric, too neoplatonic, too cabalistic, too hermetic, too maybe close to magic, in fact, were very orthodox Christians, in, in developing in their own way and taking further an essentially patristic approach to reality that, that combines the metaphysical with the cosmological, um, and beyond the fathers is sometimes trying to be more generous about other traditions, particularly saying from Pico della Mirandola onwards that we can learn, we have to learn from Jews if we really want to understand the Old Testament. And this is, you know, partly why they're into Kabbalah and so on. But, you know, Henri de Lubac already said something like Pico is actually much more like Aquinas, really, than mm -hmm. people like Kajitan and, and Smurro. And he led the way in, in, in I think, saying um, that kind of thing. So that in many ways, you know, I would argue this kind of disenchanted approach that you get from Scotus and nominalism onwards eventually really does issue in, 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 in atheism. Whereas the, the whole line that from you know, the 12th century through the German Dominicans, the Renaissance, the Romantics, that is trying to take further this sort of more enchanted synthesis of Neoplatonism and Christianity is far more likely to um, withstand atheism, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and can be uh, more, more plausibly an, an alternative version of 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 the modern, um, because, because it, um, it 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 takes account of um, the the uh, the, reali uh, the creative reality's participation in in creative power, if you like, the creative power of God. It's it's not just the doctrine of of sheer um, passivity, which is my worry sometimes about the so-called uh, theological turn in phenomenology, that it's somehow this too sort of passive uh, an account of things and, and itself too related to ultimately the primacy of um, epistemology that, it, that is itself rooted in this rather disenchanted approach to, to metaphysics, even, even it, the, despite all the attempts to sort of overcome that in, in a new kind of way. I'm, I, I'm not um, totally convinced that, that they work. I think, I think something much more like a kind of sort of slight, rather sort of Bagsonian neorealism, stressing um, the creative forces that are, are participating in, in the divine power. Um, something like that is a more, and you find the same things in Rosmini or in Bulgakov. Um, I, I think that's a more attractive, um, um, to my mind, a more, a more attractive kind, kind of alternative. And that, it, that also involves not having simply a sort of cult of the will or of charity um, separate from truth and knowledge, but a, a different way of thinking about truth and knowledge, not, not as primarily conceptual, but, but as um, 
yeah, as disclosive of reality that 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 my that truth is the mind that, that when it when it is in this disclosive relationship to reality. So, I I I, I don't see. Um, 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 a sort of huge um, division between sort of aletheia on, on, on the one hand um, and uh, apocalyptic uh, 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 on the other hand. I think I don't think these are totally two totally different ways of um, disclosing disclosing reality, even if apocalyptic has this more sort of drastically mystical and personal sense as well as one of eschatological expectation um, um, yeah thank you um you're provoking many questions in my own mind and i'm imagining that there are a number of people that would like to ask further i would like though to go to to lucy and possibly give her the the uh, last uh, question today Lucy, if you want to unmute yourself, please. Thank you, Father James. Yes, um, I'm, I, I wonder if perhaps we could spend a little bit of time unpacking um, how SCOTUS interacts with the concept of unity, because as we, we've all seen, especially in the first semester, unity, this concept of unity is just so fundamental um, to Platonic and Neoplatonic thought, particularly when you get into, for example, Platonic. Yes. Um, he talks, he throws around some terms, um, he talks about the individual in terms of numerical unity and then when he's expounding this doctrine of the common nature we start looking at the idea of lesser unity and I just wonder if perhaps you could clarify exactly what he means when he talks about these things and how that allows him to establish a, a sort of common, if it allows him to establish a common mm. ground between nominalism and platonic realism. I think it's a really, really good question, and uh, uh, and I th I feel as if there's um, a drift towards th in Scotus. Now, now you come to mention it, not that I've thought about this, but there's a drift towards thinking of unity in a very literal way that's breaking with this Neoplatonic, more mystical thinking um, about 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 unity that um because you know he's it's going to just think in terms of sort of there are literal items that either exist or don't exist and um there's a sense in which the infinite is one item you know without without any boundaries um but you and then you can still make these formal distinctions within it and uh um there's a certain way for him in which you know possibility precedes actuality in god and so forth and it seems to be losing this sense that god is one in the in a neoplatonic way that he's beyond the contrast of of the one and the many um you know that there is there is nothing outside um his unity um whatsoever you know if if there is simply sort of one being that is divided up between infinite and, and finite then you you've somehow compromised the sense that god is is not is not sort of beyond or outside in the normal ontic sense of beyond or outside you know god god is totally imminent because he's transcendent you know so that god is um is non known alia as nicholas of kids will put it he's 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 not otherwise if because he's absolutely one he can't be different from himself he can't be different from other things this is not kind of the way that scotus thinks about things um it it it, it would seem to me so i think i think there's a danger that he's thinking of unity it too much in the sense of you know ordinary arithmetic and and you know you know neoplatonism is in the end profoundly to do with with mathematics um even even apophatic theology philosophy theology in its root 
is connected to mathematics. It's connected to thinking about the one in terms of a minus sign rather than a plus sign back in people like Alcinous. I mean, this is something that in a way people are only now just beginning to investigate. I mean, there's a, um, so, you know, a very, a very different attitude to number May, may be lurking. You know, if you look at the 12th century and people influenced by by Boethius, uh, you know, people like Thierry of Chartres, they have very, as David Albertson has been saying, they've got very, very Pythagorean kind of mystical sensibilities about number, which they apply to the Trinity and, and so on. And uh, a very interesting guy called Ashard, not Richard, Ashard of St. Victor, who was English, in fact, um, I mean, he has these incredible statements about how God is just as plural as he is one, and they are the same thing in, in God. <laughs> so he, he actually says, the opening line of his treatise on the Trinity is, just as God is more one than we are, so he's more many than we are. And, and he sort of approaches the Trinity in, in that kind of way. But it's this very mystical sense of what, what number and unity would would mean in God that I, I think is, um, I think it's missing in 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 uh, in Scotus and uh, um, the sort of loss of this um, Pythagorean background that was kind of always lurking behind the um, the liberal arts program the 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 quadrivium. Part of it, and and of course, as uh, you know, Thomas was asking about Aristotle. I think the the intrusion of Aristotelian physics here is a factor in displacing um, this kind of quadrivium approach to 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 the natural world in terms of you know mystical number, music, and so forth. There's really none of that in somebody like Scotus. <clears throat> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, with no further questions coming in, I think it's a good time to bring things to a conclusion. And I think I personally want to extend my thanks. Uh, you responded to me very quickly when I uh, contacted you. Um, for those who don't know, uh, there will be um, a conversation between yourself, Father Aidan Kimmel, and me coming out fairly soon on, on YouTube. Uh, around the question of apocatastasis, that is universal salvation in Christ, um, uh, which I find which I found most illuminating. So it's it's a joy for me to to be able to listen to you once again.